Bills, 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 what is the deal? Oh, hi! You caught me catching my bills from the mail. What do you think of my new look? Red underpants outside of regular pants. I thought that I would wear this because I heard that Superman will go back to this iconic look in the upcoming Action Comics number 1000. Now, you may not know this, but Superman hasn't been wearing his red trousers since 2011. And when you look at it, I think that that change may have come from the movies. Man of Steel didn't come out into theaters until 2013, but it went in front of cameras in 2011 at the same time that DC Comics rebooted with the new 52 and took away Superman's iconic red undies. That's what I want to talk about today. Changes to superhero comics that came from their adaptations. Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Before we go any further, I want to mention that this topic was voted on by my supporters at Patreon. If you want to become a supporter, you'll have the opportunity to vote on future topics as well. So, superhero comics, American superhero comics, are kind of a unique form of entertainment in that it's a serialized story that's been ongoing for a really long time and is still ongoing. I'm trying to think of another form of media that continues on like that. I mean, maybe soap operas? Maybe arguably Doctor Who because it's been on for so long? But none of them quite compare. What happens with superhero comics that's unique is that then they have adaptations made of them, and then some of the elements that filter into the adaptations in turn filter back to the original comics. It's utterly unique, and that's what I want to explore today. The first big thing I want to talk about is kryptonite. This is a huge part of Superman's mythology, an irradiated rock from his destroyed home planet that can weaken or kill him. But it didn't show up in comics until Superman number 61 in 1949, 11 years after he debuted in DC Comics. However, Kryptonite was originally introduced to the public six years earlier on the Adventures of Superman radio show. The radio show introduced several important elements that the comics would later include, like the characters of Perry White and Jimmy Olsen. But the story gets more convoluted when we look into who actually came up with the idea for Kryptonite. Comic scholars have long known of a Superman story written by creator Jerry Siegel in 1940 that was for some reason never used. Flash forward to modern day when writer Mark Wade was going through DC's archives and came across the story. In it, a meteor made up of a substance called K-Metal passes by Earth. It weakens Superman, and he and Lois Lane end up trapped in a mine. When the meteor leaves Earth's orbit, his powers return, and he is forced to reveal his identity to save Lois. So why would this story, which predates the radio show's use of kryptonite by three years, be shelved? In Alter Ego magazine number 37, writer Will Murray speculates that it was producer Robert Maxwell who probably blocked the story from publication. Maxwell was a writer and producer for the radio show and Adventures of Superman TV show adaptations. He would have been shown synopses of comic book stories at this point in time. And this particular story by Siegel introduced two huge changes. One was the K-Metal, which led to Superman realizing for the first time that he was from another planet. The concept of the Fortress of Solitude, where Superman learns about his heritage, didn't show up until 1958. Also, Lois learns about Clark Kent's Superman identity and agrees to help him in his crusade. Maxwell probably thought both of these changes were just too big to happen so early in Superman's career, and most likely had the story buried. And of course, since he knew about them, it's no surprise that K-Metal later became Kryptonite and appeared on his radio show. 
This was just the first change that I could find happening to a character outside of the comics. It was happening in an adaptation, in this case radio, that then in turn eventually filtered back to the comics. A lot of the changes to superheroes come in the form of a change of the look of the character thanks to TV and film. I think the logic here has always been that more people are seeing the TV show or the film so they want the comic books to mirror that. And to me, this has always come across as a little bit desperate. I feel like the creators of the comics should be proud of their original version. But I do understand how it came to be. And let's look at some of the visual changes we've seen to comic book characters over the years. An obvious one is Batman, who went from a gray and blue suit for many years to an all-black suit with no underpants to more closely match the look of the Batman movies of the time that had him suited up in black rubber. This look first appeared in Detective Comics number 682 from 1995, the same year as Batman Forever. Some superhero looks were even more dynamic. Blade the Vampire Hunter used to wear a big brown jacket and green glasses in the Tomb of Dracula comics from the 70s. But when he was adapted into a 1998 film starring Wesley Snipes, Blade's look was radically different with a black leather trench coat, body armor, a sword, and a much tighter hairdo. Marvel instantly rolled this new look in. And why not? Blade was basically a C-list character in the comics, and the movie look was pretty much better. I don't think anyone would argue that it wasn't better. So, that's cool, you know, that's, that's hip, that's fresh, that's... Yeah, cool, but that black leather look that was popular with Batman and Blade, I think we could argue that it went on to overly influence comics. Because the following year, X-Men was released in theaters and their costumes were something closer to a flight suit or fetish gear than any of the classic blue and gold spandex numbers we were used to. And sure enough, a couple years later when Grant Morrison relaunched the X-Men, all of a sudden, they all wore black outfits. The one concession to being a comic book seemed to be more yellow in their X's. And this look stayed for years until Joss Whedon launched Astonishing X-Men in 2004, where he literally has Cyclops give a speech about how they're superheroes and they need to inspire people. Once the extremely popular Marvel Cinematic Universe launched, we saw a lot of visual adjustments to characters to more closely match the films. Captain America lost the wings on his cowl, and Star-Lord's helmet went from this to this, among other small changes. One adjustment that forms a bizarre Ouroboros loop is Nick Fury. In the comics, Nick Fury was a grizzled white guy, a spy who used to be a World War II soldier and who took a formula to stay young. But in 2002, Marvel released The Ultimates, a new version of the Avengers set in a brand new modern continuity. Artist Brian Hitch re-envisioned this take on Nick Fury to look like actor Sam Jackson. The comic went on to literally comment on it when Nick Fury says the ideal actor to play him would be Jackson. Then, in six years when Iron Man came out, Marvel Studios actually hired Jackson to play Nick Fury. Marvel Comics wanted to match this, so in 2012, they introduced Nick Fury's never-before-mentioned son, who just so happens to look like his Ultimate Comics version, and who took over running spy agency S.H.I.E.L.D. The last several changes I've mentioned have all come from movies, but I want to talk about TV as well, because that's influenced characters a lot, and perhaps none more so than Batman. The 1960s Batman TV show was campy fun, but it also popularized some villains that had only appeared a small handful of times in the comics. The Riddler wasn't well known before Frank Gorshin's iconic interpretation, and Mr. Freeze was known as Mr. Zero before appearing on the TV show, by three different actors. The TV show completely changed Mr. Freeze's look and gave him a German accent. But then, in 1992, Batman the Animated Series radically revised the character. Producer Bruce Timm hired Mike Mignola to redesign the suit, and the show gave him a tragic backstory where Mr. Freeze is a thief only to fund his research to save his cryogenically frozen wife. This tragic take on the character took him from the original gag version in the comics to one of the most popular in Batman's rogues gallery. 
And the animated series also gave us Harley Quinn, who is possibly the single most popular addition to a comic that came from its adaptation. Originally introduced on TV in 1992 as Joker's sidekick, she was rolled into the comic books in Batman's 1999 storyline, No Man's Land. She has continued to grow in popularity to the point that she stands as her own character, separate from the Joker, in her own title or on teams such as The Secret Six, The Gotham City Sirens, and The Suicide Squad. But if I'm going to talk about the most successful creation from an adaptation, I guess I have to address the worst as well. I knew I should have hit the liquor store today. Most of us know Spider-Man's origin and powers. He was bitten by a radioactive spider and given strength, speed, agility, the ability to stick to walls, and so on. But he didn't have webbing. Scientist Peter Parker created that himself, inventing web shooters. But when Spidey was finally adapted into a feature film in 2002, director Sam Raimi had his powers streamlined and said that he had organic web shooters. The Spider-Man movies were incredibly popular, so in 2005, Marvel Editorial decided Spider-Man should now have organic webbing. The road there was a super dark, surreal story called The Other, Evolve or Die, that took place across 12 issues. Essentially, Spider-Man loses a fight to Morlin, who is a type of vampire that eats Spider-Mans in different dimensions. In this story, he rips out Spider-Man's eye and later goes to kill him at the hospital, but Peter morphs into a spider monster and kills Morlin. Then, he runs away and cocoons up, which is not something spiders do, by the way. When he emerges from the cocoon, he now has organic web shooters, as well as a number of other powers that he rarely used, like night vision and a stinger with a sedative. And then two years later, Spider-Man got a type of reboot with Spider-Man One More Day, and all of those new powers basically just got wiped away with no explanation. It's not a great story. If you want to see my review on that, I've done it before. Spider-Man One More Day. It's terrible. Anyway, I think that, you know, as superhero comics continue to exist, we will continue to see more and more adaptations of it into TV and film. And the thing that fans need to keep in mind is that if it's, if it's going to be adapted and the adaptation is popular, there's a good chance that those changes that the adaptation makes may filter back to the original source material. But if the movie bombs, like, say, Catwoman, none of those changes will end up in the original comics. Either way, if you're just patient, comic books, at least superhero comic books, always have a tendency to reset to the status quo. You know, we'll have our stories where Captain America is killed or Captain America is turned into basically a Nazi, but then just before the new movie comes out, we get back the original Steve Rogers. It happens all the time. So my advice to fans of comic books that don't care for an adaptation, just be patient. It'll reset eventually. All right, folks, that's going to do it for this week. Until next week, keep reading comics. I've got a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first of all, please consider checking out my Patreon page. Every week I have blog posts. I frequently have exclusive episodes. I have polls where you can vote on the topic, just like this one. So just give that some thought, please. Also, uh, my friend Vincent wanted me to plug his group on Facebook. It's called The Robots PJs Fun Zone. Uh, it's a closed group, so you have to ask to join, but we have a lot of fun there. We talk about comics, movies, toys, uh, we share memes. It's a really fun place, so go ahead and give some uh, consideration to checking that out. Finally, uh, in case you hadn't seen the little video I made earlier this week, I now have an ongoing contest where if you send fan art for the show to comictropes at gmail.com, I will pick one uh, every week as a winner to receive a gachapon prize at random that I got from Japan. Um, and I'll show all of the art uh, along with your name and if you want to plug your social media or anything like that, I'm going to show that. So I have my first fan art this week. I, I got one piece. 
This piece is by Tony Hugh Morrill. Uh, if I didn't pronounce your name, Tony, I apologize. I love this piece of artwork. It's fantastic. Tony was the only entrant, so I'll just pick out a gachapon and uh, it's whatever this one is. So Tony, I will be mailing you a gachapon. Congratulations, and I really appreciate you sending in your fan art. See ya, folks.